This is by Dr. Andrew Gumps. This is laparoscopic Whipple procedure with a two-layered pancreatic OJ genostomy. And he is from the Fox Chase Cancer Center. I want to thank uh, Dr. Bowers and Dr. Eubanks and Sages for this opportunity. I was at Fox Chase Cancer Center for the last two years, but I've moved back uh, with my wife in New York mm -hmm. to Summit Medical Group in northern New Jersey. So laparoscopic Whipple was first performed by uh, Gagne and Pomp back in 1994. They really felt it was just too damn hard. It took about 12 to 20 hours back then, and, and they were appropriately worried about dissecting uh, these tumors off the great vessels. Uh, with time, uh, I think surgeons have uh, become more comfortable with the idea. Here's actually narrowband imaging which uh, Olympus tried to get me to use. This is what it looks like. Uh, the hope was that we would see more uh, tumors. Quite frankly, it didn't help at all. Here we're doing a, a, a liver biopsy. As you can see, because we're, we're concerned uh, about this patient who received neoadjuvant chemoradiation therapy uh, prior to this resection that uh, had a liver met. That turned out not to be a liver met. So, the next part of the procedure is to take down the hepatic flexure, as you can see we're doing here, and then do the coker maneuver. There's the inferior vena cava, and here's how we do the laparoscopic coker maneuver. We do an extended um, coker maneuver to expose the left renal vein as it goes over the aorta and try to expose the superior mesenteric artery. Here's the duodenum, you can see. Uh, this is a very nice to do laparoscopically. Here you can see the inferior vena cava quite nicely. Uh, you can see there's some edema and some inflammation from the neoadjuvant chemoradiation. This, I think, was my, my third, probably my third Whipple ever as an attending. And uh, I think the first three I attempted were laparoscopic. Just to give you an idea that with adequate training, you can really start to do these, I think, um, right out of the gate. That said, it took two years of uh, a pancreatic open surgery fellowship in Verona, Italy, a one-year fellowship with uh, Michel Gagné, Dennis Fowler, Alphonse Pomp in New York, and then an additional year in Paris, France with Brice Gaillet. Here you can see the left renal vein and the superior mesenteric artery was actually running up there, but I was too slow to get the pointer. So here's where the superior mesenteric vessels are. Our next goal is to get a retropancreatic window. I like to do the coca maneuver first. I like to do this even when I do do the, the uh, rare open approach. Here's our retropancreatic window, superior mesenteric vein. You see the splenic vein over here forming the portal vein further up. These laparoscopic bipolar devices are, are a godsend. I like to use these articulating instruments. Uh, helps me finish that dissection. Here you can see the transected pancreas. Here's the unsnit process, which can actually be transected very nicely with the ultrasonic shears. In the interest of time, I didn't show that. I like to do uh, classic Whipples. I, I'll preserve the um, pylorus when I can. Here's the gastroduodenal artery. I like to transect that with the laparoscopic GIA stapler device uh, because of uh, pseudoaneurysms of that site and delayed hemorrhage from that site with, uh, if you ever get a leak. So this is the common bile duct that's transected. Here you can see we're doing our anastomosis. This you can do in a running or interrupted fashion. You can use absorbable or quite frankly, you can use non-absorbable suture. Really haven't noticed a difference yet. So as opposed to previous videos of, I've, I've published on this, we wanted to show how to do a two-layered pancreatic anastomosis. And we'll get to that in a moment. When you want to start to do these after you've gained um, expertise and comfort doing distal pancreatectomies and you, you feel like you want to start to do an anastomosis, I think it's nice to start with a central pancreatectomy or uh, ideally if you are going to start with an anastomosis laparoscopically, you're probably going to want to start with a bile duct. A bile leak is a lot easier to deal with than a pancreatic leak. And in the beginning, you can do the pancreatic reconstruction through, uh, through your extraction site. I always put a five French pediatric feeding tube, even though this is, I think, a, a, a moderately sized common bile duct. It just helps with manipulation and makes me feel better. The patient will just pass this on their own. 
Some people ask me what happens if that thing is still there in six months. I really don't care as long as the patient doesn't have a problem, really haven't noticed any problems with that if it does stay there for a little bit longer. And then we'll also use that five French pediatric feeding tube in the pancreatic duct, which uh, we'll see in a moment. We have the patient in the low lithotomy position. There's the final anastomosis. And the surgeon operates um, most of the case in between the legs in the uh, also known as the French position. So we have the posterior layer complete, and we're now putting in a five French pediatric feeding tube to come through the pancreas. Usually when you get to the pancreatic duct, if it's not um, dilated, you'll need to do that with cold shears so you don't inadvertently seal the pancreatic duct. Here we're creating our jejunostomy. Actually, we just make a very small hole I've actually started to do the inner layer um, in a more of a duct to mucosa fashion. This is more of an um, intussusception, if you will. Actually, I'd like to do this with uh, 3 silks in the beginning. I would do this in a running fashion. Uh, I actually had no leaks with this technique, but it's a kind of became a little cumbersome keeping all these long sutures and needles floating around in the breeze until I finished my anastomosis. I would actually tie the completed end at the end. So you can see that's why there's all these extra strings. That said, it's actually a very, um, let me rephrase that. It's a, it's a very doable laparoscopic anastomosis. And when I was in France with Brice Gaillet, he used to do just a single uh, layer anastomosis and had pretty nice results with that. But actually towards the end of my stay there, we started to do uh, two layer anastomoses, which is the way I did it when I returned back to the United States. Again, it makes me feel better. This is very similar to the technique used when I do laparoscopic centrals. Um, that I always do with two layers of 3 silk, actually. If you use other sutures, there have actually been some studies that with the pancreatic juices, they, those sutures will be dissolved within less than 24 hours, some within eight hours, which is why I like to use silk. A little lasts a little bit longer. I think I'm in the, in the generation of uh, organic food and also conceptually feels a little better. So this is my first five cases. Estimated blood loss was 450. I've done now about 12 of these. My average time at that time was 45. I'm probably down to about 400 minutes now. Length of stay at that time was 11 days. That's coming down. I just sent home an 82-year-old woman uh, in four days after a lap Whipple. Again, this is a little bit old, but back then mortality 0% still is, thank God. Pancreatic fissure rate zero still is. Um, no reoperations at this point. One bile duct leak, uh, which responded to drainage and a subhepatic abscess after a, a G tube got inadvertently removed. Uh, I'm post-operative day 22. I no longer at an institution that makes me use G tubes, so life is better as far as that's concerned. So I believe Lap Whipple, um, surprisingly, uh, is being very well accepted should mainly be done in patients with benign or pre-malignant lesions, but you can also do malignant lesions, as, as you just saw. Um, we can even do patients with neoadjuvant therapy, though I don't recommend that in the beginning at all. So initial patients should probably be reconstructed through the extraction site until you can make sure that you do an adequate resection. Thank you very much. So as people are coming to the microphone or, or not, um, Beautiful, beautiful work, great feasibility of, of being able to do this procedure by a relatively young attending surgeon, so I think that's fantastic. I am not a, a robotic surgeon. However, when I've watched these videos of laparoscopic whipples, I've questioned whether this would be an appropriate application of robotics in general surgery in terms of efficiency, time, just smoothness of the procedure. I was wondering about your thoughts on that, having had experience with direct laparoscopy. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of the robot uh, in its current form. I actually use a smaller robot made by uh, a French company. It's uh, autoclavable. It fits right on the patient. I'm able to touch my patient if I need to, especially in the beginning. If I need to put a hand port in to feel that superior mesenteric artery, I can. Uh, I think I'm able, I was able to do malignancies quicker because I did not use the robot. I've heard a lot of people who do use the robot, if they have a problem, they have to go directly to an open procedure yeah. because they don't know how to do laparoscopy. This I don't like very much. Th that said, I think the robot uh, does have a future. 
Um, I actually saw Dr. Moser had a nice video with one attending holding at the robot and another attending in between the legs. So I actually had two surgeons. I think that's economic suicide for <laughs> the rest of us, but at the University of Pittsburgh, it looked quite beautiful. So yes, I think there is a great future for robotics, just not the current one. Other comments or questions? Excellent work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.